Grace and mercy and peace from God our Father, the Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. So you need to share with you some thoughts on Pontius Pilate based upon the reading from the Gospel tonight. Please join me now in prayer. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would keep us fresh in the Spirit, so that our hearts may never harden by our own choice. O Lord, again in the Old Testament, with the heart of Pharaoh, it was he, not you, that started the process. You just finished it. Help us, O oh Lord, therefore, not to start that process. Enable us to stay faithful so that we receive the crown of life. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A French doctor named Guy Payton said in 1692, I saw a woman today who finally became hard as wood all over. This is the first clinical description of a disease that slowly and irreversibly turns people into solid bone. It's not very well known. The disease imprisons the entire body, back to front, top to bottom, ligaments, tendons, and muscles solidify as the body becomes as hard as cement. The rogue gene of this disease has one goal, slowly harden the body until it's dead. We're in a sermon series called Witnesses to Christ. Tonight we meet Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is one of the most notorious people in history. Some people think he's right up there with Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, even Osama bin Laden. Someone thinks that if Pilate's name happened to be mentioned at a baseball game, the crowd would probably begin booing and throwing beer cans. <laughs> the Apostle Creed includes these words, which sets Jesus Christ in the midst of history, suffered under Pontius Pilate. It is a great phrase to have in our Apostles' Creed, because one of the things that we admit with the phrase Pontius Pilate is that Jesus actually existed. In all mythologies that you can study, the Greek and the Roman gods had no record of an historical visitation. We only have stories of gods taking the form of people, but nothing to connect them with history. Pontius Pilate was a person that was notoriously known, but at the same time, he is a blessing for the Christian faith because it makes Christ a true historical being. God visits man and Jesus, and this is not a myth. This is real. And it happened under Pilate. A person where you can find records testifying to his existence outside of the Bible. Now Pontius Pilate had an acute case of hardening. Only in Pilate's case, though, the gene went straight to his heart, back to front, top to bottom. Spiritual hardening has one goal, a slow hardening of our hearts until we dead, spiritually dead. But uh, like anything else, in a slow hardening process, you don't usually notice it at first. You know, you miss one Sunday, then you miss two Sundays, before you know it, the third and the fourth just become real easy. And the devil has got you where he wants you away from that which keeps your heart alive. Our first priorities are just sometimes a little mixed up. But then very slowly before we know it, we stop praying. We stop repenting. We stop trusting Jesus. 
We stop seeking to be refreshed in his word and sacrament in the flesh and blood community called the church. Then the day comes when the words such as Jesus Christ and Holy Communion, Bible study, baptism, worship, and even Easter, Christmas, and salvation have no impact on us whatsoever. Our hearts are hard. Our hearts are cold. That's because the hardening of heart has that one goal. A slow hardening of our hearts. Until we are all spiritually dead. Paradise. According to a Latin inscription found in 1961 on the Mediterranean coast, Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea for 10 years, from 26 to 36 AD. Pilate was born from a middle class family. He had served the Roman army in Germany. One year while on leave in Rome, he married an upper class Roman woman named Claudia Procula. Claudia was the granddaughter of the well known Caesar Augustus. The one that was reigning when Christ was born, the Roman Emperor. The granddaughter of Caesar Augustus, the Roman Emperor, that's who Pilate married. Pilate was in. Because of this connection, Pilate got a position he would never probably have gotten in any other way. What position did Pilate get? Governor of Judea. It wasn't the best of Roman stations, but at least it was a star. That's Pilate's past. That's his beginning. And then this history of Pilate meets the history of Judas. Judas was leading a posse to arrest Jesus on Thursday night. After arresting Christ, Jesus now stands on trial before Jewish authorities, not Pilate right now. He stands before trial before Annas and Caiaphas. And finally, even before, therefore, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. They accused Jesus of blasphemy, calling himself the Son of God. It is a crime punishable by stoning. There's one problem, though. The Jews wanted Christ to experience a more painful, shameful death known to man, a crucifixion. Crucifixion was created by the Assyrians, it was perfected by the Romans. In order for that to happen, the Jews had, had to get the consent of Pilate. They had no authority to put a guy on the cross. They knew they had the authority to stone a person to death, and Pilate and Rome would look the other way as just another matter among Jews. But they could not bring Jesus to the cross. That's God's plan, isn't it? Through these two entities, through the Jews and through the Pilate, all people put Christ on the cross, Jews and Gentiles. God's plan has the whole world condemned Christ to the cross. We are part of that party. Pilate plays his part. That's what John said. As they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters, it was early morning, they brought Jesus to the Roman fortress Antonia. It's about six in the morning. They're all there. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, all of them. And they have Jesus right where they want him. And soon, soon, they'll have Pilate right where they want him to. Pilate asked a few routine questions, such as a good judge would. He first asked the question, well, tell me now, what has this man done wrong? Give me his case. Well, the Jews don't answer directly. That's because there's no rule of law against blasphemy. Again, if this is all it was, Pilate said, then take care of yourself. I don't care. If you want to stone the guy in the streets of Jerusalem, I will look the other way. So why are you bringing this man before me if it's a Jewish matter only? Romans 
Roman history tells us that Pilate didn't even like the Jews anyway. They were just a troublesome group to rule. He didn't understand them, their, their worship, their ethics, their culture. And Pilate didn't want to waste his time in religious debates with the Jews. Pilate's heart was becoming harder by the minute to what justice should be. Pilate then questions Jesus. He says, come on, are you, are you the king of Jews? The all important warrior is king. King means one thing to the Jews, Messiah. It means something else to the Romans, though, treason. Jesus answered, Pilate, you say that I'm the king. This means, yes, I'm the king, but not the kind of king you're thinking of. The chief priest wanted to confuse Pilate into thinking that Jesus is a revolutionary leader. A man guilty of treason and a threat to Rome. Because you know what Pilate will do if Jesus is convicted of treason. Now we've got the cross. Before, it was just a matter of stone. But treason is enough to put a guy on the cross. It doesn't work right away, though. Jesus tells Pilate that my king is not this world. Everyone has got this all mixed up. They don't have their story straight. So seeing that the Jews wanted their pound of flesh, Pilate still had an innocent man by the name of Jesus scourged, just probably short of death. But the crowd wants more. They want Christ not just killed, but they want to crucify him. And so finally the Jews play their trump. They say to Pilate, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Pilate knows exactly what they mean. The Caesar, the king at that time, was named Tiberius, and he was sick. He was always suspicious and often a violent man now. A Roman historian tells us that Tiberius could turn on his underlings and be very savage. Tiberius wouldn't like it news about a riot in Judea. Especially when Judea's governor was appointed only because of family connections. So, if the Jews got word to Tiberius that Pilate let a man go who was making himself king in opposition to Rome, Pilate's job would be lost. Pilate now seeks to save his king. Pilate, after all, he was just middle class. He really had no upper class to defend himself, no authority, influence with Emperor Tiberius to influence his mind. Besides, Pilate earlier had handled, mishandled two Jewish problems before. Would Tiberius tolerate a third? Or would it be three strikes and you're out? Can you maybe see now the prediction, the predicament Pilate is in? He must be thinking and scratching his head. Do I let this man go and lose my job? Or do I crucify an innocent man to save my job? What would you do? All depends on where your heart's at, right? If your heart is hardened to justice and innocent, you would make the choice of pie. Choose to save your job at the loss of an innocent man. So therefore the Jews blackmail against Pilate works. The choice had been between Jesus and the Jews, only Pilate would have let Jesus go. But he had been put into the corner. The choice now was between Jesus and Rome. Jesus and his job. People will do many things to save their job, their status, their reputation, even crucifying an innocent man. Pilate asked one more time to try and get Jesus off the book, off the cross. You like crucify your king? The king is a familiar type looking for a battle. No, this king is the suffering and bleeding type looking for us. He is the king who cleanses sin-stained hearts, the king who heals deep brokenness. The king who calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The king who triumphs over death. 
the king who knows the exact place and time of his own execution. And he still goes there anyway. All for us. The chief priest answers Pilate, We have no king but Caesar. And there Pilate gets a victory. There Pilate gets a victory. All these years, the people of Israel were not going to recognize Roman authority. They were set to depose Rome as much as they could with all their efforts. And now because they want Jesus dead, they're willing, they're willing to say, we submit to Rome. We have no king but Caesar. Pilate gets a victory. Things are really getting out of hand, though. That Jewish riot, Pilate didn't settle it down within his career. So he pays in. Pilate is, has Jesus executed. Nailed to the cross by hands and feet. Lifted to hang. Suspended between heaven and earth. And why did Pilate do it? His heart had become as hard to justice as Mount Rushmore. So do you see Pilate's pattern? What's in it for me? That's what we see throughout John chapter 18 and 19. What's in it for me? That's Pilate's pattern. Pilate is climbing the ladder of success. And through this kangaroo trial, Pilate gets an admission of loyalty to Rome from the Jews. Something no one else had ever done from the Jews. Pilate gets that victory. But in the end, he's really only caring for himself and is trashing everyone who gets in his way, even Jesus Christ. That's a pattern we follow more often than we care to admit. We're all finally not that much different from Pilate. When we look at our heart, when we look at our own motivation, what's in it for me? It's a recipe for our heart heart. And our heart heart is like a rugby ball. It mangles marriages, it kills kids, and it finishes off family and friends. A spiritual hardening is killing us. Check your heart now. Is it hard or soft? Is it callous, insensitive, indifferent? Is it dead? It's not too late to have a softening heart, to have a spiritual heart beating with energy again. <coughs> we are promised in scriptures that our Heavenly Father will create in you a clean heart, a new heart, a heart that is spiritually alive through his means of grace. He'll mold that stony heart of yours back into life. This is his promise for you, Christ Jesus. Ezekiel 11. I will give them one heart. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of spirit. God will take away our stony, stubborn heart, give us a tender, responsive heart. What's that all mean? It means our hearts, because of Christ, will beat again in his name. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God which will pass all understanding keep your heart in Christ, Christ Jesus.